This is Math 151. Section 2.3, we're going to talk about <clears throat> more about limits and basically kind of the relationships uh, in using limits. So last time we talked about a couple of ideas, things like um, the limit as x approaches 8 of 7. Well, as x approaches 8, 7 is always 7. So there's, there's one relationship. So um, I might rewrite this just to generalize it. And this is this is the you know because it's a it's a constant. So I might rewrite this as limit as x approaches a of some number is just that number. Notice there's no x in there that's changing. B is always b. And there's a couple other things we can talk about too. We have like uh, sum and differences. So for example, if I'm finding the limit as x approaches some value of uh, some things that are added together like f of x plus g of x, whatever they are, I can, I can break this up and do those limits separately. I can say the limit as x approaches a of the first thing, oops, x, plus the limit. And it's the same thing with subtraction as well. Like I can break this up with subtraction. So if... Uh, So this helps us with stuff like, I mean, it, it helps us. We don't always need it. So for example, finding this limit, the limit is x approaches two of three x plus five. Here's the thing. I know that three x plus five is, is continuous in a straight line. It doesn't have any gaps. It doesn't have any jumps in it. So this, I can just, I can just evaluate this. We talked about this last time. I can just plug in the two, uh, three times two plus five, six plus five is 11. Right, because I know that's a straight line as it approaches 2, this will approach 11. If I needed to, I could use these relationships and break it up. Right, I could say uh, the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 5. And notice again, 6 plus 5. So we can break it up if, if we need to. We don't always need to. And this holds with multiplication and division as well. In other words, if I was multiplying uh, two functions together inside a limit, that's multiplication, I could take the limit separately and then multiply those limits together. And it's the same thing with division. And, and the problem just becomes, uh, with these, the problem is when one of the limits doesn't exist. Because then I can't multi I don't have anything to multiply by, and we're, we're gonna we're gonna deal with that. We have a couple assumptions here again. That's that these individual limits do exist, and also that this g of x is not zero because we can't divide by zero. Like I said before, most of the time, um, not most of the time, some of the time we can just plug in a value. So on this first limit, limit. Um, as x approaches 3 of this, notice if I, if I just plug it in, I get 3 squared plus 1 over 3 times 3 minus 1. In a way, I'm kind of doing both of those separately, right? Because I have to I have to evaluate that numerator and that denominator anyways. So the top part goes to 10. The bottom part goes to 8. So as long as I did my arithmetic correctly. 5 fourths. If I'm not dividing by zero, if everything's legit, um, I know that it's good locally, I can just plug it in. Same thing here. I could do all these separately. Limit as x approaches negative 3 of x squared of 2x of 5. That's basically what I'm doing when I plug in the negative 3. And then whatever number that is, uh, 9 minus 6 plus 5, I think that's probably uh, 8. But it's not always this easy. This problem, we know there's a hole, uh, or maybe uh, some sort of discontinuity, you know, like it could go up to infinity or something like that. But as I look at this, if I just try and plug in the 2, I'm dividing by 0. And in fact, if I plug in the 2, I have 0 over 0. And that 0 over 0 is what we call um, an indeterminate form. 
In other words, we can't resolve it, at least in the form that it's in. So how do we deal with this? In the past, as in last lecture, what we did was we made tables and tried to do that. Now that's pretty burdensome as if you did the homework you, you know. So one of the things that we can do if we have indeterminate forms is we can try and simplify this. In other words, let's mess around with, uh, with what we have. x squared minus 4, I know I can factor that to x plus 2 times x minus 2. And x minus 2, now this is nice, uh, x minus 2 divided by x minus 2 is 1. Basically what I did was I, I filled the hole in the graph. This is a graph that looks like this, and there's a hole there. That's why I can't evaluate. But if I factor and then simplify, that's equivalent to this. Now I can just plug it in. 2 plus 2 is 4. So we're going to talk about how to deal with these uh, some of these indeterminate forms. And the first method that we have is, if we can, factor and cancel. Factor everything out, cancel out, hope that this dividing by zero cancels out. If it works, we're in good shape. If not, we might have to go back to using a table. So we're going to go over some techniques, uh, possibilities of things to do for indeterminate form. So this is a this is a list. I said one. I probably shouldn't number them because they're not sequential. It's just possible possible things to do. So factor and cancel. For example, that's this problem that we did here. We can factor factor things. Hopefully, our dividing by zero cancels out. If it does, then we can just plug and go. Here is another example. So the limit as x approaches negative one of this function. And notice if I try and plug it in, I'm dividing by zero, so I can't just plug and get a value. And actually, if I plug a negative one in here, it's also a zero. This is a zero over zero in determinate form. So in this one, um, the idea of, of factoring and canceling looks pretty difficult. So I'm going to try another thing, and this will be often, like, this is when problems are in this form. Uh, you know, notice we have square root of something minus one and then just like a, something linear down there. Multiply by the conjugate. Okay, just a little bit of side um, knowledge here first. We know that a plus b times a minus b is a squared minus b squared. Right, if you multiply it out, the middle term, that's a positive a b, that's a negative a b, the middle term drops out, a squared b squared. And these numbers, and we did this with complex numbers, these are called conjugates, a plus b, a minus b, things in that form. Because when you multiply them together, the middle term drops out. The problem with one of the problems, well, we don't know what the problem, the problem here, one of the many problems here is we're dividing by zero, but we also have this square root. So when I, when I say multiply by the conjugate, I'm thinking of this square root of x plus 2 minus 1, that's like an a minus b where a is square root of x plus 2, b is 1. So the conjugate of that would be a plus b. So what I'm going to multiply by, and again, this is technique. This is technique to learn and know how to use. So notice um, what I'm multiplying by is 1. This is a 1. I'm not changing the, the value of this fraction. I'm just changing the form. So I'm multiplying by this version of 1. And the reason I do that is notice up top what happens is if I multiply these things together, a minus b times a plus b, I get a squared minus b squared. In other words, I get the first thing squared minus the second thing squared. And that is over this x plus 1 times uh, that what I multiply the denominator by, x plus 2. Uh, plus one. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to multiply this denominator out because what I'm hoping is this x plus one gets canceled out. So let me keep going from here. So this thing squared is just x plus two, right? The square root squared gets rid of the square root. Minus one squared. Minus one. And notice that that is x plus one, right? That equals x plus one. And that's over uh, this x plus one times and don't forget to drag along that you're finding the limit here. 
should have written it here as well. Okay, we did all of that work so that this would divide out. It does away with our problem, which is dividing by zero. So now we're finding the limit as that approaches negative one of something that's roughly equivalent to it. What we're doing here when we cancel things out is we're filling in holes on the graph. Okay, so then this, I can, I can now just plug that in. 1 over negative 1 plus 2 plus 1. 1 over square root of 1 plus 1. It looks like that is 1 half. And if you're not happy with your answer, check it on the graph. Like, graph, graph the original thing and, and see what happens, right? We can find limits uh, on graphs. We can find limits on tables or, or look at it on the table. Let's take a peek at another problem that's like this. Uh, factor and cancel. You know, if I was really clever and I knew a way to factor this into one of those, I, I could do it that way, but that seems like a lot of work. I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. So the problem is if I plug in negative 3, I'm dividing by 0. I actually have 0 over 0. So let me multiply by the conjugate. This is square root of x plus 4 minus 1. So I'm going to use square root of x plus 4 plus 1 because I want the middle term to drop out when I multiply by it. And uh, I'm multiplying by 1, so I'm not changing the, the value, I'm just changing the form. I'm not going to multiply the denominator at all, because I'm hoping that x plus 3 will cancel out. And I'm pretty sure it will, because, you know, sandbox problem. Um, but let me multiply these together, and I know that it's going to be the first thing squared minus the second thing squared. So x plus 4, the square root of that squared, is just x plus 4, right? Because I'm squaring the square root. Minus 1 times 1 is 1. And this is x plus 3. So conveniently, boom, boom, that divides out, leaving me. I'm going to plug it in now. This is a 1, 1 plus 1, 1 half. These answers are always one half. All right, there is a, a third case that I want to do, and it's pretty algebra intensive. So what I have is complex fraction, fractions over fractions. Um, so simplify this fraction first. Again, if I just try and plug in, plug in, can't divide by zero, and actually... This would be 1 half divided by uh, minus 1 half. This would be 0 over 0. This is definitely indeterminate form. So let us do a little bit of work on this. So I notice in this numerator, if I want to subtract these fractions, I need a common denominator. So I'm going to multiply this one by uh, 2 over 2 and this one by x plus 1 over x plus 1. And that gives me uh, 2 over... 2 times x plus 1 minus x plus 1 over 2 times x plus 1. And the denominator is coming along for the ride here. Not using it yet. And, do, 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 do. yep, common denominator. So now I can subtract up top 2 minus x plus 1. Notice I'm just dealing with the denominator or the numerator right now, right? So I'm just simplifying this up. So 2 minus x plus 1 is 2 minus x minus 1 if I distribute that negative. So then that is uh, negative x minus 1 over 2x plus 1. Oh no, that's negative x plus 1 over x minus 1. Whew. Now, if I think about this thing right here, it's a fraction divided by a fraction. So I'm going to do a little scratch work right here. This is the same as saying uh, negative x plus 1 over 2 times x plus 1 divided by x minus 1, right? Like the top fraction is divided by the x minus 1. And now dividing by something is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. Like dividing by 5 
is the same as multiplying by one fifth. That's all that I. That's all that I did. And uh, let's see. I'm hoping something will cancel. Okay, I'm going to do some clever factoring here. This negative x plus one, and this x minus one. I'm going to factor a negative out of this. And notice if I factor a negative out of this, it becomes that. So now, boop, boop, those cancel out, leaving me the limit as x approaches 1 of negative 1 over 2 times x plus 1. And that x minus 1, that bothersome x minus 1 that was in the denominator is gone. I canceled it out. Notice each of these three techniques, the goal is to get rid of that 0 that's in the denominator so that we're not dividing by zero anymore. Now it doesn't always work on any random problem, but uh, when it works, it's a beautiful, gorgeous thing. And we're not done yet. We actually want to evaluate this, so plug in the one. Negative one over two times one plus one. So that would be negative one fourth. So the limit of this function as x approaches one is negative one fourth. I'm gonna do one more example like this. Same sort of idea, so if I plug in a negative 4, I have a 0 down here, and there'd be a 0 in the numerator as well, 0 over 0. So this is a complex fraction, so I'm going to simplify it. First thing I'm going to do, uh, I'm dealing just with the numerator right now, common den denominator would be 4x. So I'm going to multiply this one by x over x, this one by 4 over 4, and that gives me x plus 4 over 4x plus 4 over 4x over 4 plus x. Well, 4 plus x is just the same as x plus 4. So I can see I have those 2x plus 4s sitting there just waiting to be canceled. Um, you might see how to cancel it right away if you don't. A little scratch work right here. This is x plus 4 over 4x divided by x plus 4. Dividing by something the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So those cancel out. So this is the... That because those x plus 4s canceled out. Plug in that negative 4. 1 over 4 times negative 4 is negative 1 16th. So those are just possibilities. Right? Those don't cover every case. Uh, those, are, those are good practice cases though. And much of your uh, homework, much of your practice will be problems tailored specifically to those techniques and sometimes though you just have to play like sometimes you just have to try and manipulate so if I were to plug in a 3 right now I'm dividing by 0 at least here um, and probably here as well so I think that what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try and actually do the subtraction sometimes just do the arithmetic that's inside the limit and see what happens so I have a fraction minus a fraction. I need a common denominator to combine those. So I'm going to factor this x minus 3, x plus 1. So these both already have an x minus 3 in the denominator. This needs an x plus 1. So I'm going to multiply this fraction by this. That is going to give me x plus 1 minus 4 over x minus 3 times x plus 1. Notice, um, right, I, I got the common denominator, x minus 3 times x plus 1, and then I could combine the, I could do the subtraction in the numerator then. So this, x plus 1 minus 4, is x minus 3. And how convenient, boom, ba boom, leaving me something I can just plug into. Most of uh, the limit problems that you run across in, in this assignment, you're going to be able to do some reducing, like, right, they're set up for that to happen. If it doesn't happen, you're going to have to jump back into using a table or jump back into using a graph, and it could be that the limit does not exist.
Now, there's one little uh, kind of quirk that I want to, to get at, and this is with these, these uh, two-sided limits, uh, sorry, one-sided limits. And I have this uh, square root of x minus 2. So if I think about that, that graph looks like this, where this is, this is x is 2 right here. Um, right, it would look like that. So if I think about my limit from the right-hand side of this, if I'm approaching this from the right, I'm good. I can just plug it in. Because I can approach it from the right. There actually is, remember, the limit is not necessarily, it's not about what goes on there, it's about the neighborhood. So as I'm approaching 2 from the right, my y value is approaching 0. In this case, even though I can plug the 2 in there and evaluate it, there's nothing to the left of this function. This actually, this limit from the left of this does not exist. Because there's nothing, there's, there's, I can't be on the line and approach this from the left. So, um, if you have a graph that's truncated a bit, you have a one-sided limit only. So let's take a look at some uh, compound functions. So this sort of definition, f of x equals blah blah if x is greater than 2 or blah 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 if x is less than or equal to 2. So what that's doing is that's, that's taking the, the graph, here's 2, and it's, it's splitting it up. So if x is greater than 2, in this region right here, we get the, y, the output by going 4x minus 3. But if x is less than or equal to 2, this region here, we get it by... Uh, evaluating x plus 3. So basically they're, they're two different lines. You know, we're in the x plus 3 realm until we hit 2, and then we're in the 4x plus 3 realm. And we have a couple of possibilities. Like, what could happen is they could just meet at that point. Or they could be, like, disjoint, right? Like, they just don't meet at that point. Um, and they're, di they're different lines, right? So they won't have the same slope or whatever. So if we have a case that's like this, we know the limit exists at that point. And in this case, the limit does not exist at that point. So let's go ahead and figure it out. The limit of f of x as x approaches 2. So really what we want to get at is technically, while x is greater than 2, we're checking this. So we're finding the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. And then this is when x is less than 2. So on this one, we're checking the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. Basically, we can plug 2 into both of these. So this one would be uh, 4 times 2 minus 3. 8 minus 3 is 5. This one would be uh, 2 plus 3. It's 5. Yeah, so notice they both tend towards 5. So the limit's 5. Now on this one, though, if we if we check it out, again, this one, x is greater than 1. This one being g, sorry, the second one. So this this is one where we're checking 2 from the right. Uh, sorry, 1 from the right. Plug it in. 3 times 1 plus 9. And we're checking 1 from the left, 1 plus 1. Those are not equal to each other. So this would be a case where from the right it heads towards 12, but from the left it only heads towards 2. Right? disjoint. They're not going towards the same spot. So this limit then does not exist. And notice it, it doesn't matter what actually happens at 2. Like if I, if I put a third condition onto this f and I just said when x is greater than 2, when x is less than 2, but if, when x equals 2, this thing equals a, th a thousand. That's okay, the limit is still 5. But what happens is there's just an open circle here and like it evaluates to 1,000, but the limit is 5. Okay, the, the last thing I want to touch on is an idea that's called the squeeze theorem. You know, sometimes all of this, uh, the algebra manipulation and such doesn't get us anywhere. And so this is super, super clever, I think. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a bunch of... Uh, math language at you right now. So here's our idea behind the squeeze theorem. 
So I have some functions. And I'm going to say that f of x is smaller than g of x, uh, less than, which is less than or greater than, than h of x. When x is close to a. So, so here's what I here's what I mean. Like, so I have some function f of x, and here's a right here. A is just like an x value, and I have this other value, um, h of x. Notice h of x is greater than f of x, and g of x is in between them. And it's between them near a, like it doesn't have to be between them later, but just kind of near a. So notice that just even from this definition, you can see that f and h are squeezing g. They seem to all kind of squeeze in and get really close to a. The closer you get to a, the more h and f converge towards g. So you can probably guess what, what, what the punchline is. That means the limit of g has to be between the limits of h and f as long as they're all like converging towards a. So this is true and the limit of f of x as x approaches a, not nine, and the limit of h of x as x approaches a, if those are the same limit, if they both approach l, right, like this would be the height l, um, then the limit as x approaches a of g of x must be l. They kind of squeeze down and they all converge like that. So as long as I have, I know that G is between H and F near A and H and F converge or their limit converges, then G has to have that limit as well. This is kind of a roundabout way of getting at a limit. The limit as X approaches zero of X squared times sine one over X. Instead of just finding it, I'm going to tell you that the limit is zero. And we could kind of peek at a graph. You know, we could graph it and that, that might show us. But I'm going to use the squeeze theorem to show that it, it has to be zero. This limit does not exist. I can't just break this up with multiplication, right? Like I can't just go the limit of this times the limit of this. Because that one does not exist. This one's zero. So let's let's hold on to that piece. We know that that this is zero. Zero times does not exist. It doesn't equal zero. Like you, it's indeterminate. You can't you can't get a value for that. So let's make some arguments. One of the things I know about sine is that sine can only output values between negative one and one. Hopefully you remember that from 142. So sine of x has to be between uh, negative one and one. So that means if I multiply everything by this x squared, negative x squared has to be less than x squared times sine one over x, which has to be less than x squared. All I did was I multiplied everything in here by x squared. x squared is always positive, right? It doesn't flip into the inequalities. So if this is true, I know that this has to be true. Right. So notice now I have my original function squeezed in between negative x squared and x squared. So uh, think about the graphs of these. Negative x squared looks like this. x squared looks like this. And see how they squeeze in on the zero? Whatever, whatever this mess does, it's going to have to go through that zero spot as well, or at least the limit will have to. So in other words, if I say the limit as x approaches zero of negative x squared, well, that's zero. The limit as x approaches zero of positive x squared, well, that's zero as well. Therefore, I can squeeze this limit out and it must also be a zero. Very, very clever. Squeeze theorem is... Uh, is some gorgeous, gorgeous math. All right, I'm going to um, 
stop talking at you for now and let you get at some assignment, uh, some home homework practice. Make sure you're posting questions. Make sure you are sending messaging me with questions as well.